everybody. Today I am interviewing TJ Manisterski, the head coach of Curry College Division Three program just outside of Boston. I think you're going to love this. If you're into coaching, leadership, uh, you got to check this out. It was just an awesome conversation with TJ, and I know I'm going to have him on again. Thanks for his time. You can find him at tjmanisterski.com. And uh, I really highly recommend um, following along and, and hearing what he has to say and also checking out the interviews at his podcast. Here we go. Hi, TJ. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Nate. Happy to be here. Let's jump right into it. What do you, when you think about player-centered leadership, what does that mean to you? For me, that's just about putting the players first and thinking of them as people, not players, right? They're not a a pawn on the chessboard, they're humans. So we're, we're teaching and coaching humans and we're putting their interests first. And it's an all encompassing philosophy that, that dictates the decisions we make uh, on a daily basis, how we interact, how we practice, how we train, how we communicate, even so far as how do we set up the user experience of a day. So when, when you walk in the door for practice, you know, what do you see? What's your path? Where, you know, where are your granola bars or, you know, all the different things that, that like, it, it's literally down to, to that level of, of thought and care. Uh, but it's, it's about really, you know, what does it feel like to be a player in this program? And what does it feel like to be coached by this coaching staff? When did this focus start for you? I think it's an, it's, it's really an authentic, authentic um, piece of who I am. I think it started a long time ago as a player, but it took a while for it to surface and come out in my coaching. And when I got the head coaching job at Curry college, I was the youngest head coach in the, in the NCAA. And, you know, it probably took me four years before I really figured out who I was as a coach and, and how, I could be me running this program and, and creating an environment and being intentional with, with all those aspects. And it was really after a losing season. We went into uh, a year where we had high expectations and we ended up missing the playoffs. And that was a tough, tough experience for us and for me as well, especially because as the head coach, you are, you are embarrassed and you, you're feeling like you failed. And I think the first reaction for many people in those scenarios, and it was for me, was I started looking for some excuses and, and blaming things for, for why that happened. But at a certain point, I realized that uh, it's on me. And, and I re-examined everything we were doing. And one of the big things that came out of this was I thought I needed to do a better job communicating. And went into the next season with this this plan to communicate and where that what grew from there was was a better connection and my experience of taking ownership of that losing season and then teaching ownership that became a pillar of our program and also what came out of that was this growth mindset idea and uh, those are the three things that really came out of that that tough year that I looking back on it was the best thing that ever happened to me as a coach and the best thing that's happened to our program, because since then we've been, you know, a 700 winning percentage. And I, and I think a lot of that wow. has to do with the environment we've created. Wow. You use that word connecting and communication. Tell me a little bit about the impact that your podcast has had on, on that communication, on the, on the parents of recruits and parents of existing players. You've even mentioned to me before current players. Well, a really neat thing happened this summer was one of our incoming players called me on the phone out of the blue and it's August. I'm in the backyard and, and he says, coach, can we talk about leadership? And I said, sure. Well, what's up? Where's this coming from? You know, this is not a common phone call to receive something like this from a player. And he said, well, you know, I was just listening to your podcast and I wanted to talk about a few things. So we had this conversation that probably lasted 45 minutes and it, at the end of it, it really dawned on me, like what an impact that was in the sense that if it were not for the podcast, him and I would not have had that conversation. And now because we did have that conversation, we've connected on a whole new level. 
yeah. he understands me, I understand him. And I think that's, you know, the other thing that's really interesting is, is coaches, I think we've really, I would hope that every coach is really trying to find ways to understand their players. But players also should be taking the time to try to understand their coach too. Mm. And that's something that maybe isn't being talked about as much. So when players get to read something I've written or listen to a podcast, they are understanding me better. And it creates this, this really nice loop of really empathy and understanding. And I think it brings us together. I can't help but notice some of the language that you're using around, uh, you know, player centered leadership and empathy and listening and connecting in the traditional sense of what many people think of college sport. This is innovative and this is new. Would you agree? Well, I think that the, the language in those, those philosophies of how to run a program or, or how to just lead people and, and, and work with others is probably, I don't know how new that is. It, I think it's, it's fresh in my environment. I think some of the ways I'm going about it, like with the podcast and with the blog, that's certainly unique in the sense that I don't see very many, if any other coaches doing it. And uh, I think there's lots of reasons for that, uh, but it, it has been beneficial. And for me, just to learn, you have yeah. conversations with people. I mean, what it's one of the best ways I've found to learn is to speak with others and, and people that are really knowledgeable. Yeah. You and I've talked a little bit about authenticity and, and, and you were in your, your heart on your sleeve as a, as a coach, college coach, letting the players into your world to, and, and you've expressed the, uh, the impact that that's having. Um, how, how'd that feel in the beginning, you know, when you hit, hit send or you hit live or you hit publish, what, what was that like in the beginning for you? It's not a whole lot different than it feels now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it's always, yeah, you, you are putting yourself out there and you're worried a little bit about how is this going to be received? Are people are going to like it? Are people going to think you're a self promoter? Are, and, and there, I'm sure there's naysayers out there. Uh, but the amount of good that's come out from it, and I'm just talking specifically with my team, and recruiting and the relationships that I have in my life, whether it be new people or old friends that have come back in that otherwise would not have, it's just been, it's just been, uh, you know, really unbelievable. And I think what it does, and it's a natural extension of how we operate the program and how, how we lead in our program. And, you know, we had this really interesting thing happen to me in the first semester back in the fall a player was, uh, you know, he was killing time. He was hanging around the dressing room and I was there. So he just came in the office and he said, Hey coach, what's, what's special in your life right now? And I remember that question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Nice. It, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. I, I wasn't expecting it. And I was like, okay, well, this is unique. I, I, I'm going to try to lean into this and have a real conversation. So I actually told him, what was special in my life right at the time and it was really an interesting thing because i did have a to-do list about a mile long at the time right and i was trying to bang these things out and and probably a couple minutes into the conversation i really just settled in and i thought you know what there is nothing more important anywhere in my in my life right now in this conversation and how lucky i am that i had a player who actually asked me that question and it reminds me of a time the first time a player ever asked me to have a coffee, I was like blown away. I'm like, this is like, it's funny. The things you remember, like that stuff really means a lot. Let's line that up beside who you thought you needed to be when you came in as that youngest head coach in the NCAA and, and what sort of paradigm you thought you might need to adopt that didn't lead to, well, it led to that tough season eventually, but who did you think you needed to be coming in before you'd, before you'd really learned uh, going down this journey you're on now? Yeah, I'm not sure I had a, a clear idea of like, hey, I'm trying to be this certain person. I know I had some very clear ideas about what I wanted my culture to be about. And I came in knowing that there were some things that, that weren't lining up exactly the way I, I envisioned the program. And I, and I came in, I think I built up some walls early because I knew that there were some changes that were just going to have to be made. And no, that's the hardest thing, part of the job, right? And and that just took some while to a while to get through, 
but I, I guess, you know, I, I was at the time a lot more stern. It was a lot more of a direct approach, a lot more instructing. Like if you came in to have a player meeting with me, then it would have been like, okay, well, here's the things that you should, you need to do. And that was it. Whereas now it's, I probably talk, I definitely talk less than the person, the player, right? It's, it's, I'm asking some questions, I'm listening and I'm, I'm trying to help guide them along and empowering them to, to come up with the plan and the, the ideas and, and support them through that. So that's, I, I guess, the, the biggest contrast. I probably listen a lot more. I'm way more likely to take their advice or, or and it's still, it's still hard to do, right? Like last year, we had a, had a player come in and he thought that we should maybe be thinking about a different forecheck. And, you know, the thing is, players have no idea how much time you put in to coming up with what you are doing. Mm -hmm. But he had a suggestion. And I listened and I didn't say anything, but at first I had, I was resisting it in my own mind. I worked through that and listened. I thought about it. I went home. I found the team that was doing this for check. I watched it and I just realized this is a better for check for us. And we switched it the next day and, uh, <laughs> and it's been great and it's been really good ever since. So would I have done that eight years ago? Mm, no, no, I don't think so. Yeah. You know, I think one of the things that got you and I on this call together is, is this idea of redefining coaching and using coaching as a, as a tool, asking questions and helping empower decisions and decision making and empowering the team. What do you think that that player realized to have the guts to come in to suggest that to you or to even be considering what the team, how the team might benefit with this change versus head down, do as I'm told, command and control. Like, what do you think led to that opportunity for him to, to come and see you? Well, it's, it goes back to how we operate and that how ownership is one of the pillars of our program. So it didn't happen overnight. That's for sure. This, that would, that moment was, was years in the making mm. realistically. And it took time, it took time, it takes time for the coach to get comfortable with this. It takes time for the players to trust it too. And, and it, we've done a lot of different things to, to build those skills and that, that sort of task cohesion of a group. An example I could give you is we'll do a team after action report. So we'll, you know, on a Monday after the weekend's games, before we go out and practice, we'll have a, a dialogue as a team. And the basic structure is what went well this weekend that we'd like to keep doing. What would we like to improve on this week? And then just a general sense of where, are, where's our head at? What are we thinking about? What are we feeling about this week as we head into our next opponent, because we're in this transition period of we need to learn and, and improve on what we just did, but we are also thinking about what's next. So having this open conversation has been, uh, we've gotten better and better at it. And we've had some really profound things come out of this conversation, but we've been working at this for probably three or four years, but because that, you know, there are times when players will bring things up that might seem a little controversial or do they really want to say this to the coach? And, and then it's all in how you respond, right? If, if you, if you shut them down right there, well, that's dead. Like they'll never do it again. But if you, you know, appreciate their, their idea, you listen. And there's also been lots of times that they've suggested things and, and I haven't done them. So mm -hmm. there's examples of both, but I think, I hope, and I do believe that they understand that, that I want to hear it. And I want to, and I will listen. And I will consider it. I'm hearing a ton of things that resonate in high performance culture, the trust that's between you and them and the ability to practice that muscle of critical thinking. You're encouraging them to think rather than just telling them to listen your ability to be humble enough to be open to their ideas and strong enough to decline them when you see fit and adopt them when appropriate and including them in the process and those those transcend college hockey uh to 
high performance culture, workplace engagement, psychological safety in the workplace. Is this a great place for me as a human being? Am I, is my life better because I'm a part of this culture rather than worse off? And so, uh, yeah, those are themes that I talk about on a daily basis and, and, and work through with leaders in, in all sectors. And um, the sport is often used as the metaphor, but you're actually practicing it. Um, just when I, when I play all that back to you, how does it, how's it landing? I agree. I, what, what it made me think of is that to build an environment like this, first of all, it's not perfect, right? You make mistakes all the time and, and you don't get it right. But when there's a sincere effort to do it this way and it's understood by everybody and you are, what you are doing is you are building a, a motivation for the people in the program that that is sustainable right it's not a one-off raw raw speech and they're motivated like they're in a situation where they're counted on they feel they have a voice so they're they're uh they have some some choice some autonomy in what's going on and and even when when they're involved in the the process even if the decision is to do something that they maybe wouldn't choose because let's be honest you put 25 hockey people in a room and ask them to agree on something is, is really unlikely. There's going to be 25 strong opinions, but hopefully you can get to a point where the, the people that don't necessarily agree with the choice or the decision you're going to do will freely choose to buy in anyways. That's really important. And I think that this is the strategy. This is a strategy. It's not just like Kumbaya and campfire stuff. Like, yeah. This is actually a strategy to win for me. Yeah. It's, it's difficult and authentic uh, conversations. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, let's put the cards on the table. And at the end of the day, you're the leader. Uh, and in that process, we, we've come to it for X number of reasons. And uh, yeah, so let, let's just, we're going to keep this, um, I could talk all day about it. Let me put it that way and ask you more about it and hear more about it all day. If you could define again, there's a naysayer out there that says the inmates are running his asylum. And, you know, if, if, if they're really pushing back against some of this, although you're, the points you've made are, are compelling and, and are in line with high performance culture across, across our, our, our leadership spectrum. Um, what do you, how do you clarify the difference between this approach and what you went through as maybe a player or in your early days of coaching that was not like this to the, to that naysayer who thinks that you're giving them too much? A couple of things. First is how would you like to be coached? Yeah. Right. And how do you want to be treated in the workplace? Right. Do you want to be given an opportunity to have a, have some control over your destiny do you want to have some choice over what you do every day? Do you want to be given an opportunity to grow within your role and perhaps into bigger roles? Do you want to feel connected to the people you work with and the company and the, the bigger vision and purpose of things? Uh, then if, if you think that you'd like to be in that environment, then that's, that's what we're doing, right? And that's what's motivating. And that's why it's sustainable. The other thing, I would think is that I heard this from Bill Beanie, who's a legendary retired coach at Middlebury yeah. and one, I'm not even sure. I'm going to say whatever, eight or 10 something national championship. I think more. Yeah. Go for it. Go ahead. A lot. He, he was talking one time and he said to get control, you need to give up control. And it's a scary thing to do. But once I would say start small, Start with one thing, try it, and you're gonna see you're gonna see it work, and you'll slowly get you'll get there, step by step. Well said. Which Bill Beanie did be in the Pioneer and Small Area Games. That's uh, which has been a foundation of my hockey coaching since I was just getting started. Yeah. Um, and and I know the influence he he has had in your area and in your country. 
you know, it's funny. I'm going to, I've never done this in an interview before, but in my, in my, uh, in my training this morning that, that, that I was on before this call, we were talking about directive versus non-directive and uh, we've got control and ownership. And uh, I'm just going to put it right up to the camera here. The big claw is you're trying to be controlling, right? And, and in the, the small claw of the lobster is you're being less controlling and the people end up taking more ownership. So the themes, again, the themes you're bringing up cross, cross a lot of uh, the world I'm living in and, and the world that's inspiring, I think, both, both of us to, to, to bring an element of this to our leadership. So TJ, hey, where can people find you? Because I know there's some uh, coaches and players listening who, uh, who want to learn more. Sure. Well, if you go to tjmanisterski.com, would be the one-stop shop where you could find the blog and the podcast. And it's the Coaching Project podcast. And the newsletter has been a new initiative this year. It's been, it's been going really well. And on Twitter, at TJ Manisterski. And, and I, I do hope everybody will come to go to curryathletics.com and check out our team. And you can find out more of uh, all the things we're up to. Thanks for that. And on that note, there's a lot of players out there. I know watching this who are saying, I want to play for a coach like this. Tell us just a little bit more about Curry athletics and Curry hockey and, and the league you're in. Sure. Well, Curry college is in Milton, Massachusetts. We're seven miles from downtown Boston and Milton is a beautiful town and our campus is gorgeous. It's, it's one of those places where there's not a blade of grass out of place. It's, it's really a, a typical, prototypical New England style campus just on the doorstep of Boston. So what really is a game changer for our students is that access to the city where you can, whether it be networking, internships, uh, professional relationships, entertainment, fun, experience, life experience, but also have that tight knit close community and beautiful campus feel. And uh, so from an institutional standpoint, you know, I think that, there's a lot to love. You don't really have to sacrifice anything there. And then as far as hockey goes, you know, our team's been very strong. We play in the Commonwealth Coast Conference, the CCC, which is one of the strongest conferences in Division Three hockey. And uh, like I said, we've had a lot of success the last few years. And we just went into a new facility and one of the best, we now have one of the best dressing rooms in the nation. So, so it, it makes that user experience and of walking in every day for practice really, really nice. And uh, yeah, I drive on campus every day and I think, wow, this is, this is still feels really good. Right on. Now, a lot of the athletes that we work with out here in Western Canada are less familiar with the routes, the inroads in at the Division Three level. Uh, how would a great hockey player and a great young man best find his way into your uh, attention, into your inbox, onto your voicemail, into your recruiting list? Just tell us a little bit about the recruiting process. Well, sure. I think like every, every program, you end up building sort of some of your niche areas that you focus your attention on. And, and that's based on sort of your experience and background and, and where maybe the strengths of your program lie. And because you have limited resources. So you're trying to like, you, you can't, at least at our level, we can't be everywhere. So, uh, so from British Columbia, Western Canada, we have had, a number of Western Canadians. And, you know, so we are watching those leagues. You know, I think in general, generally speaking, if you want to stand out is to, is to be genuine with your interest. It's very easy to see an email come into your inbox and, and be able to decipher that this has probably gone to a hundred coaches as well, which necessarily isn't necessarily a really bad thing. But if you want me to take it seriously, I like to know that it's that you actually have genuine interest in Curry College. And if you really want to step up, give me a call, pick up the phone, because nobody does that. And wow. what I've done is I've started in the last couple of years, I'll reply, I try to reply to all the emails and I'll just say, hey, call me on this number and I'd love to talk to you about our recruiting. And it's the fastest way to get through all the emails. And I, I couldn't even tell you the numbers. I don't know. One out of 20 will actually pick up the phone and make that call. So it, it's, it's a great way for me to pre-qualify. Like this person's actually interested for one. Yeah. And then, you know what? Like it, it's kind of, 
uh, I'm impressed I, I, that they had the courage to do that because I do recognize that that's a challenge to make that phone call. And, and it can be daunting, especially for the players of the ages that I'm coaching. They're just, you know, they don't use their phone to make phone calls. Yeah. So it's different. Yeah. 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 Hey, if you're open to it, this won't be the last time we talk. I learned a lot. It was really great insight, really valuable for leaders and athletes watching people in the hockey world or in real life, as we call it. And I just thank you a lot for your time, TJ. You can find him at tjmanisterski.com and Curry College. Awesome. Thanks, Nate. Appreciate it. Right on.